Thank you for joining us today. We believe at Emmanuel that God wants to bless you right where you are. In fact, my hope and prayer is that through this service, you'll be encouraged, your spirit will be lifted, you'll gain some new insight or perspective, and learn some practical ways on how to improve your life. If you've been blessed in any of these ways and you'd like to partner with us financially, you can go to eclife.org forward slash giving and select the giving option that works best for you. In doing that, you can help us reach more people with our message. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope this service is a real blessing to you. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Church. We are so glad that you're here. If you would, stand with us and sing this morning. You come into darkness.
I want to hear you now. Let's sing it. Go. I lay my burdens down. My yoke is easy now. What a friend I found in you. Cause you're the well that won't run dry. Only you can satisfy through every season of my life. You are the well that won't run dry.
It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Oh, bless the Lord Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh, my soul Worship his holy name seemed like never before oh my soul I worship your holy name you're rich in love and you're slow Good morning and welcome to Emmanuel. My name is Matt. We've got just a few things for you this morning before Danny comes up to kick off week two of our brand new series, Unoffended. How many of you were here last week to see week one or saw it online, some version or another? It's just as good for week two, I promise you, uh, some good stuff coming up. But before we do that, we just want to say uh, welcome if you're a guest with us here this morning. If you were invited by a friend of yours or uh, somebody who had been harassing you for a long time to come to Emmanuel. Maybe you just jumped in off the street. Either way, if you're a guest, we just want to make sure that you feel welcome this morning. Hopefully you've got a cup of coffee, uh, feeling good, and uh, maybe we've beat some of those expectations already. But if it is your first time, we have a connection card that's designed just for you. It's in the seat back right in front of you. looks like this. And we just want to point you there because if you take that card out for us, give us some basic information about you. And here's what we'd love for you to do. Uh, you can drop that in the offering bucket as it makes its way by here in just a little bit. But we'd, we'd also love to give a 
to give you a free gift just to say thanks for sharing some of your Sunday morning with us. And to do that, you take that card to the information desk, which is just outside and to the right of the auditorium on your way home. We'll put that gift in your hands as well as some information about our church. You know, uh, if, if you've been here maybe the first time today, but maybe you've been here a little while, maybe your journey with Christ just started or has been around for a long time. But if you've got tough questions about this thing that we call Jesus in our faith, and we have an environment that's designed to just help you explore those no matter where you are on your journey. We call that starting point. And uh, if you've uh, re- received Christ recently and talked to our folks at the back corners of our auditorium, maybe they've mentioned that. But our next starting point session is going to start next week. And so if you've got those tough questions, no matter where you are in your journey of faith, this is a place to explore those questions and find the answers that you've been looking for. Uh, now, we have incredible things that go on here all the time, but I got to tell you that, yes, we are still thinking about summer, even as winter seems to dawn upon us again. And one of the things that happens around here in the summer is our summer camps with our student ministries. And so we take a big group of students uh, to summer camp. And I don't know if you've had a summer camp experience uh, in your life, and it's a great opportunity for students to get to know Jesus a little more and also some people around them. And we actually got a story from a student named Gabe that I want to share with you this morning. Here's what Gabe Bruner says. He says, you know, before going to camp, I just went through the motions and didn't truly understand God's love for me. But when I went to camp, I met Danny Shrinko and Ricky Trimby, who were my adult leaders. These two guys, along with my cabin mates, they poured into my life. And through their example, I've been reading God's word almost every day which has led to a complete change in my life and my daily decisions. I now know God's love for me. And that's just one story. And so one of the things that we would love to do around here is to try to make camp more affordable uh, for all the families that want to send their students. And we're doing that through selling some T-shirts. Maybe you saw the awesome models up here last week showing those off. Uh, But you can buy one of those T-shirts for $15, which is just out into the right at the registration desk on your way home today. So we want to encourage you that if you'd like to help make camp more affordable for some of our kids, uh, that you can do that as well. And for some of you, that's actually a next step for you. So some of you that give around here sacrificially, this is something above and beyond of what you already do. And for you, we just want to say thank you for doing that. When you sacrificially give to the work that God's doing around here, we get to see people come to Christ and grow in Christ, which is what we're all about. So for those of you, thank you. If you have yet to join us on this journey uh, in ministry, we just want to say, hey, we try to make it as easy as possible for you. So in your handout each week on our website, but also on the screens to my right and left, you can see how easy it is to jump in and give. Maybe for you, that's jumping in through the app. You can do it online automatically like my wife and I do every week, uh, or every payday, that is. Uh, And so we just want to encourage you that if you haven't joined us yet, to jump in and support what we're doing. Will you pray with me as we receive our offering? Lord, we come to you grateful, grateful that we can come to a place and have our hearts challenged. And Lord, as we do, we just ask that our minds uh, and that our hearts are open to you, uh, that we remain open to receive what it is that you have for us, even as those of us give back a little to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
want to welcome everyone to Emmanuel. How are you doing today? Pretty good? If you're joining us at the Vanta campus, we welcome you. At the Franklin campus, we welcome you. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. We're in week number two of a series called Unoffended. And if you missed last week, I just want to give you a quick update on what we said last week and how we got started. Basically, we began by talking about the reality that everybody is offended these days about something. Have you noticed that? Everybody seems to be mad about something. Some, something that some politician said or some political decision or, or maybe even someone in your home or what someone said on television or what someone said on Facebook or Twitter. Notice how angry people are on social media. It's amazing. People are mad and they are offended all the time. And we said that that the reason people are offended so easily is because they like it. It's easy to get offended. People like to be offended. It's become a way of life for certain people. Have you noticed that? Some people don't know how to live without anger, without being offended. They don't know any other way of life. For some people, they get offended because they have high expectations of other people. They expect people to think like they think on every, on every issue, and that's just not going to happen. And then we also talked about pace of life. We're so stressed out, and we're so gung-ho, and we move, and we're going. We have very little grace to give people. We said getting offended is hard work, right? Doesn't it wear you out? Anybody ever experienced the exhaustion of being angry? Yeah, it's, and so we want to talk about this because we want to overcome, we want to get rid of that, that burden of, of offense and anger. We said that offending or being offended also causes us to make foolish decisions, right? We said that, we looked at a verse that said that basically anger rests in the lap of fools. We do stupid stuff. I remember back when I was in high school, uh, we, we, uh, a couple of buddies of mine, we, we knew about this guy that was doing some really bad things to, to kids in the community, it was kind of a, a, a well-known thing. The police even got involved. And we, my, my little posse of friends there got together one night. And we said, you know what? We don't like this guy. We actually know some people that he hurt. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to drive over to he owned this baseball card shop, you know, front store baseball card shop. And what we're going to do is we're going to drive over there. We were so mad, you know, what he did to certain, certain kids. And we're going to get out. We're going to bust his windows. And I'll be, the, I'll be the getaway driver. And I, I let, you know, my cousin be the, the rock thrower. He actually had a brick. And so we were so mad. We drove over there one day, and, and we pulled up. It was in the middle of the day. This is real brilliant. This is smart. You know, 16 years old, you know, middle of the day. I drive it. We were so mad. You know, we were so offended at this guy. He hadn't been arrested yet or whatever. And so I pulled up. You know, I had a little hatchback, you know, Nissan, little hatchback thing. You know, my cousin pops out. I've never told my dad this story, so he's... He, so I might be in trouble. But anyway, um, so he pops out, runs up through this, you know, the, the store had a glass front, runs up, just throws the brick through this window, shatters the whole front of the, of the store, jumps back in, you know, I hit the gas and uh, we get out of there and I'm like, yeah, you know, and then I lived in fear for like a whole year because, you know, it's the middle of the day. And uh, stupidity, stupidity. We make, anybody else make stupid choices when you're mad? Get back at people, take matters into your own hands, right? Thankfully, thankfully, uh, the police never did arrest me for that, for being the getaway. They may, they may now, now that it's out there. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Um, the reason we didn't tell my dad, because I knew he would kill me. Okay, I told my mom, like a year later, I, I fessed up, uh, but never did tell my, my father. So, okay. So yeah, we want to get rid of we want to get rid we want to get rid of, of offense we want to get rid of anger because it we, it just destroys us we, we make foolish choices it destroys relationships have you noticed that it just I mean you cannot continue to be in harmony with someone and also hold a grudge or also you know just be mad at them and it's such it's such a huge distraction I mean people who are always offended it, it takes up space in their mind and I we talked about that last week and so we got to get rid of this stuff Jesus said anger and offense is too hot to handle we got to we got to get it out of our lives and so we looked at this idea that it's possible it's possible for you and I to become the type of people who can live without offense Proverbs 19 verse 11 says this a person's wisdom and that is what we need we need discretion and we need wisdom it yields patience it is to one's glory to overlook, say it with me, an offense. It is glorious to be the type of person who can overlook an offense and say, you know what? It's no problem. Don't worry about it. It is glorious 
to be that type of a person, right? It points to the glory of God when you are that type of person. So last week we talked about this idea of letting God be God and trusting him to be the boss, right? Letting him control things. Your job is to pray a simple prayer. Lord, not my will be done, but yours be done, right? And so, so I surrender to you. You're the boss. You can handle anger. You will, 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 uh, can do the whole venge, the, the, the revenge thing, and I will just trust in you and let you do your job. And so that's what we talked about last week. And uh, hopefully that was uh, helpful to you. So today what I want to talk about is kind of take, take a little bit of a different angle. You ever get behind a really slow driver in the fast lane? Has that ever happened to you? It's annoying, isn't it, right? It happens frequently to me, and, and I get upset a little bit. Not too much, just a little bit. Like, why are you in that lane? Like, if you're going to go slow, just move over. You know, it's very simple, very simple. And, you know, and they don't, they don't know what's going on or whatever, but sometimes I'll even think to myself, you know, who gave you your license? Like, what's going on there? (laughs) Have you ever noticed that, like, if you're a guy, you always say, what is she doing (laughs) in the fast lane going slow? And then if you're a girl, you're like, well, what's he doing, right? It's always, I don't know why that is, but that's, that's kind of the way that works. And, and, and they're kind of like an idiot. And so you think to yourself, what an idiot this person is, right? And you, you have, you know, you, you know, feelings towards them. They're not necessarily godly. But when, and you think to yourself, man, I would never do that, right? I would never go slow in the fast lane. But when you really think about that, haven't you done it? Haven't you done it? Somebody said no. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the problem. That's the problem. When you really think about what... What people do that offends you, 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 and you think deeply about it, you, you, critically about it, you come to find out that, wait a second, I've done that too. I have done that. I have driven slow in the fast lane. But when I do it, see, there's a difference. <laughs> see, I'm innocent, see? I'm on a Sunday drive. I'm relaxed. It's my Sabbath day. I have pure motives. <laughs> see? So when I drive slow in the fast lane and somebody gets up real close to my bumper, like, they're actually the idiot, too, for doing that. I'm like, I'm just chilling here. I love Jesus. Look, at, look how he's changing the leaves. I'm all godly, and you should go the speed limit anyway, right? And, 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 and so I'm awesome when I do it, but when you do it, you're an idiot. Have you noticed that? What is that? I, I mean, and you might be, maybe, maybe the driving thing doesn't apply to you, but what about, what about flatulence? <laughs> this is amazing. We have a family of five, not joking, seriously, I think, you know, flatulence is the evidence for God. He has a sense of humor, I promise you. He is there. He is there. He created us. He, he gave us the ability to flatulate. Okay, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm not, not joking here. So when someone in our house, we're watching a movie, when someone has really offensive gas in our home, man, people are offended. I mean, it's like, you know, sometimes it'll be so bad. I don't know how it works in your family. It's like, you need to get out. If you do, listen, if you do that again during this movie, it's going to be $2. I'm going to charge you two bucks per fart. You know what I'm saying? It's bad. I have teenagers now, you know, and they eat lots of food and, you know, it's all... By the way, it's never my wife, because girls don't fart. I'm just saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, you know it's true, you know it's true, just want to clear that all up right there, okay? They don't, they don't do it, so it's not my wife. But when, but when I have some stuff going on here, listen, it's just like, hey, you know, I just got some stuff going on, I can't, you expect me to hold it in? Like, what? I mean, it's not that bad anyway, I mean, it doesn't smell that bad, I mean, come on. It's like when I do it, when I have the issue, it's kind of pretty cool and awesome. Because then dad, dad, you know what I'm saying? Dad is dad, you know. But when you do it, you like get banished. <laughs> what is that? What is that? And, you know, maybe you do it in some different ways. We, we're just this, this phenomenon. We, we, we come down hard on others, but we're easy on ourselves. Like what is that, you know, dynamic? What causes that? And I think, and I'm not the smartest person, but this is my, this is my, my thoughts. I think it's the fact that we're not being honest with ourselves. We're not being honest with ourselves about reality. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is talking to a group of people that have become Christ followers, and he's trying to get them to change. He's trying to get them to become the new people that God created them to be. 
And I want, you, I want you to see what he says here. He says, guys, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, the life you lived before you met Christ, your, your former, you know, life, patterns, habits, thoughts, actions, all that stuff. You were taught regarding that way of life to put off, to put it off, to take it off, like you take a helmet off, you take a jacket off or whatever, to take off your old, he calls it your old self, your former life, your older way of doing things. And then he says this, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. Wow. This word right here, deceitful, means to give off a false impression, to manipulate, to literally lie. See, you and I, we've got an issue with lying. I just saw something the other day. The average American lies 23 times a day. How about that? So if I'm given a 30-minute talk. How many times will I lie in this talk? Hopefully none. Hopefully none. But I'm just saying, it's an issue. It's an issue. 23 times a day, people lie. Because we got this thing, we got these desires inside of us, we got this problem with deceit. In the, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, Jeremiah says this, the heart is, say it with me, it's deceitful, it's manipulative, it likes to lie above all things, and it's desperately sick. Some versions say it's desperately evil, and who can understand it, right? It's beyond understanding. Why do people do what they do? Why do they lie? Why do they manipulate? Why do they deceive? We don't really know what's going on in the heart. See, you and I, we want to be, or at least be perceived as better than other people, we want, we want people to, to think better of us. We want to think better of ourselves. Here's what's true about you and me. You and me are always rooting for the home team. That's just true. We're always rooting for the home team. And the home team is who? It's you. The home team is me. And I always want to appear better than I actually am. In uh, Brent Hansen's book, Unoffendable, he tells a great little story. I love it. It's not really a story. It's just an illustration. He says, just watch football fans. Love this. Anybody love football fans? Just watch football fans. One team's fandom is positive, absolutely positive, that their receiver was in bounds when he made the catch. And the other team's fans are truly convinced that he wasn't. Same play, same evidence, and half the fans will feel that they've truly been victimized by the referee's call. <laughs> you ever been there? <laughs> he goes on to say this. Yes, we are absolute masters. We are absolute masters at changing reality to fit our narrative. We're absolute, absolute masters at changing the facts to fit the story we want to be told. We will lie, cheat, and steal. Well, not steal. We will lie and we will deceive to, to, to create a story that fits the narrative that we want to see. And so we do this about ourselves. You know, we do this with our kids. We think our kids are better than other kids, your other kids. Because we, we're, we're not biased. We don't have an objective perspective. We want to think that our children are better. We do this with politics. This is why it's so hard to have a, 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 a good conversation about political matters. Because we are very, we, we are prone to change reality to fit our narrative, the story we want to be told about the president or about the election or about this or about this policy or whatever, we will, we're not unbiased people. Our hearts will lie. We will deceive. We will change the facts to fit our reality. Some of you remember Reggie Miller, big Reggie. I'm not going to pick on him, well, just a little bit, okay? Reggie Miller fans? You remember when Reggie would shoot well, he would shoot a lot, but do you remember when he would shoot his interesting shot? I really couldn't even do it for you because it was weird. You know, he had, had this different shot. And then when he would, what he would do is he would kick out his leg. <laughs> remember that? Ah! <laughs> and why would, he, why would he kick out his leg? To do what? To deceive the referees, right? To, he, he was a major flopper. Now, some of you are offended by the fact that I would even say that about Reggie. You're like, What? He never flopped one time. He got foul. Why do you think his leg went out, you know? <laughs> Jump shooter's legs always go out. No. But Reggie was a master, master at deception and fooling the referees into thinking that he got fouled. And all the Pacer fans are like, what? <laughs> foul. Now, why would, listen, why would the Pacer fans, none of you, of course, why would you, like, roll with that? It's because you're rooting for the home team. 
We're rooting for the home team. And so we're willing to change our narrative, change reality to fit the narrative that we want. That we want. And so then something happens. And let's bring this back to real life because we're talking about being unoffended. Then something happens in our life. This is the nature of human beings. It's true about me. It's true about you. We're deceitful. We, 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 we change truth. You know, we like to fudge things to fit the story, you know, to benefit us. Then something happens in our life and someone offends us, says something, does something, crosses over into the street, you know, uh, gets in front of us and offends us. And, and who's the first voice that we hear? When, when the event takes place, when there's a trigger, who's the, fo- the first voice that you hear about what just happened? Whose voice is it? The one you cannot trust. Yours. And we've just proven that. Because you will see things in a way that will benefit you, the home team. And your voice is the first one on the scene saying, this is what happened, and this is what happened, and, and, and that's all that happened, and so I'm offended. The voice that cannot be trusted is the first voice on the scene. And so the Bible says this in Proverbs 28. Those who trust in themselves are fools for this very reason. Because your perspective is skewed about what what just happened. Why? Because you're going to look at it through a lens that that benefits you. You're going to look at it through 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 a situation that benefits you the most in the end. Because you are rooting for the home team. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. See, what the problem, the reason that, we, that we're deceptive or we lie is because we want to look better than others. And we're willing to lie to do it. And that causes all kinds of problems in our lives. There's a story in John chapter 8 about a woman who was brought before Jesus. And uh, she was caught in adultery. And the, the Pharisees who were self-righteous and to the max, they wanted to catch Jesus in a kind of a contradiction against the law of Moses. They wanted him to contradict the law of Moses in regards to adultery. I'll re- I'll, let's look at the story together. So they made her stand in a group uh, and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the, in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it says that we should stone such a woman. That's what, the law, that's what Moses said. And then he says, you know, they were trying to catch him. But then they said this, Jesus, what do you say? Okay, here's the setup, right? They're expecting him to kind of contradict what, what, what Moses said. Watch, watch, Jesus, watch what happens. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Interesting. We're going to get back to that in just a second. And then they, when they continued to question him, he straightened up and said to them, watch this, beautiful words. Maybe some of the most powerful words in the New Testament. Let any one of you who is, say it with me, without sin be the first to throw a stone in her. And then again, he went down to the ground and he started writing with his, with his finger. He says, guys, if you, if you are sinless, if you are innocent, you throw the first rock. You can, you, that, look, you're right. Moses, Moses, that's what the law says. But if you can stand up on a pedestal as, as, as perfect and sinless, if that's who you are, go ahead, by all means, throw the first stone. Watch what happens. This is incredible. At this, those who heard began to, say it with me, go away. They began to walk away at that time. The older ones first, probably because they had more self-awareness. Until Jesus was left there with the woman still standing there. And then he said to her, where'd everybody go? Is anyone going to accuse you? Jesus said, no, they all left. And then Jesus says these powerful words. He says, then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What happened here? Why did these guys put their rocks down and walk away from this situation? This woman was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. Here's what happened. Jesus kept them honest. (laughs) Jesus kept them honest. He turned their eyes back on themselves. He said, fellas, what's the true condition of your heart? If you're innocent, man, throw the first stone. And what happened, and, and, maybe, and maybe what happened, we don't know this for sure, but maybe when Jesus got down on his knee and he started writing, maybe he was writing the sins of all of the guys standing there. Maybe he wrote pride. Maybe he wrote theft. Maybe he wrote greed. Maybe he even wrote lust. Maybe he wrote adultery. We're not sure what he wrote. 
But we do know that he said, guys, if you are innocent, if you are without sin, then hey, by all means, throw the first stone. And they started to walk away. Why did they walk away? Because Jesus kept them honest about themselves. In your notes here, this is a major idea here I want to cover. Dishonesty about your own condition creates self-righteousness. Please don't forget this. When you fail to see your own condition, when you think that you're better than other people, you will lift yourself up on a pedestal and you will start to point fingers and you will start to pick up rocks. Because after all, you'd never drive fast or slow in the fast lane. What the heck are you doing, you idiot? I would never do that. Where's my rock? (laughs) But when we're honest and, and we say, you know what, I've done that too. I've done it too, it's okay. In fact, I've done worse than that. (laughs) All of a sudden, it softens your heart. And offense goes away. You can walk away. You can say no problem. See, what Jesus was trying to get them to see, and this is so important in your notes there, he's trying to see, trying to get these guys to see the truth about themselves, that you are just as guilty. Guys, you are just as guilty as this girl. And when we see the true condition of our heart, we walk away. We drop the offense. We're not offendable. We're unoffendable. Because we know the true condition of our hearts. Thomas Akempis, in his famous book um, called The Imitation of Christ, he said this, The spiritual person places before all cares the care of his own soul. How's it going with me today, God? Not all the other seven billion people on the planet, or my co-worker at the office that bothers me, or my boss that's so demanding, or this spouse that doesn't do anything, or my children that are crazy. Not how is it going with them, but how is it going with, within my chest? The spiritual person places before all other cares the care of his own soul. And he that earnestly applies himself to this will have little to say about others. Now, why will he have little? Why will the spiritual person not carry rocks around? Why will they have little to say on Facebook about people? Why will they have little to say on Twitter about people? Why will you not hear a condemning word? Why will you not hear anger from them? Why? Because they are concerned about the condition of their own hearts, and they know it's not good. So they're very quiet about the condition of other people's hearts. You with me? This is hard stuff. But this is the path toward becoming like Christ and being unoffendable. Oh God, the problem's with me. I'm self-righteous. I'm filled with pride. I'm filled with greed. I'm filled with lust. Help me with my issues, God. The spiritual person places before all other cares the care of his own soul. And whoever applies himself earnestly to this has little to say about others. That's a powerful, powerful idea. How do you become unoffendable? Well, you get honest about yourself. That's real simple. You get honest about you, <laughs> that you, that you tend to, to lie and deceive to make yourself look better than others, that your heart is deceitful and desperately evil, hard to understand. You get honest about your own condition. And when you're honest about your own condition, you, you, you come low and you have a lot more grace to give out to other people. In the book... Chapter 9, Unoffendable by Brent Hansen. He, the title is Reverend of the Dumpster. Let me read you this quick story, true story. There was once a pastor in the days before the internet took off who availed himself of adult magazines when his wife wasn't around. He knew, what he, he knew what that what he was doing wasn't right, of course, but he did it anyway. His wife left for a few days on a trip, and when she was gone from the apartment, he brought the magazines out of hiding and Later, as he he was so frustrated with himself by his continuing addictive behavior, he said, I have had enough. And once and for all, he he threw the magazines away. He took loads of them to the dumpster, which sat at the base of their apartment stairwell. He got rid of them. Sadly, and perhaps you can relate to this, he later wanted them back. His wife was to arrive soon, and the trash hadn't been collected yet, so he quickly So he returned quickly to the dumpster. Struggling, he leaned over the side to reach the magazines. He lost his balance and he fell inside, breaking his arm. He couldn't get out. It was just him, a pastor, trapped with his magazines, bleeding for help in a dumpster. And that's where his wife found him. True story. 
Brandt goes on to say, wouldn't it be incredible to be part of a church and a group of people that said, I'm a dumpster kind of guy. I've been caught in the dumpster. What kind of church would that be? It'd be more like an AA meeting, wouldn't it? Like nobody shows up in an AA meeting like, got this licked, you punks. <laughs> Where's my rock? Like, like people show up in an AA meeting, like the first thing they say is, I like, hey, I'm Danny and I'm an alcoholic and I really want to drink right now, but I've been sober for so many days. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be refreshing to be part of a church like that? where we can get honest about the reality that I'm the kind of person that gets caught in dumpsters. I'm a dumpster kind of guy. Getting better, but still broken inside. I'm the kind of guy that drives the car up to some dude's house or store and breaks his window. That's the kind of guy I was when I was 16. Now, I don't do that anymore, just to let you know. I want to encourage you. Don't break windows anymore as a pastor. Um, you know, making progress there. But I'll never forget, I'll never forget the fact that Jesus looked at me one day and he said, I know all about you. I know that you broke the windows and I know that you did all of this other stuff. And here's, and here's what I want to tell you. I still love you. You're exposed you're exposed. You're caught in the dumpster. Yep, you are. And when I had that experience with Jesus, when he ambushed me with that type of grace and love, you know what I did? Right after I got saved, I confessed to my mother. I went right to her. And I said, Mom, I got to tell you something. I think I might get arrested if it, <laughs> if it ever comes out, if somebody shot a video or something like that. But I, I got to tell you, the reason I told her is because Jesus had looked at, he's seen the whole thing, and he said, I still love you. I know all about it. In fact, because you're a sinner, because you're the type of person that throws bricks through windows or at least drives the getaway car, <laughs> that's why I came. See, if you're sitting here today thinking, well, I would never do that. I would never get in this slow lane. I would never throw a rock. I would never, I would never, I would never. You still don't understand. You're not getting honest with yourself. I want you to contemplate this. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's you. That's me. Every single one of us have, have sinned. Every single one of us are caught. You know, you know how I know we're caught? You say, well, I've never been in a dumpster before with magazines. Okay, that's fine. You've been somewhere. Yes? Yes? I don't see your head shaking. Yes? You've been somewhere you shouldn't have been. You've done something you shouldn't have done. Yes? I want you to contemplate this right here. It's a picture of the cross. Why the cross? Why did Jesus even have to come and allow himself to be nailed to a cross? Here's why. Because you and I are caught in the dumpster. That's why he came. The cross reveals our condition. If we weren't dumpster types of people, the cross wouldn't have been necessary. We could all just kind of, you know, become good. But the reality is, is that we're dumpster people. And aren't you glad that Christ came to fix all that? Aren't you glad that Christ came to make us different types of people? The type of people that don't climb into dumpsters every day? Maybe that's where we've been, but that's not where we're going. Amen? Anybody? The cross reveals who we are. We're sinners in need of grace. We come, we come to Jesus because we need grace. The Apostle Paul said, apart from grace, there go I. Apart from God, there I go. I am by what I am by the grace of God. Now, when we get honest about ourselves, here, here's, here's the application. When we get honest about ourselves and what, what's really going on inside of our own heart, here's what we do. We become the type of people that we might pick up a rock, we might. Because you're going to get angry, yes? I'm not suggesting that, that anger is never going to pop up. But when it happens, you'll be quick to say, you know what? Hold up. Let me get honest. Let me remember what's going on. Let me remember that I'm the guy that threw the brick through the glass. Let me, remember all that, let me remember all that I've been forgiven of. And when I do that with my spouse or my kids or with somebody else, here's what happens. Rock goes down. Not offended. Because I've been there. 
and I'm just as guilty, and I probably have done worse. And what that does is humble my heart, and it allows me to give grace to those who offend me. Isn't that beautiful? It takes some soul work. You gotta dive deep. I hope that you'll do that. My challenge to you this weekend is to get honest with yourself. And the cross, when you contemplate the cross, that's what's gonna happen. You see yourself for what you are, a sinner in need of grace. Now, there's some of you here today, maybe for the first time, you say, man, I need need the cross. I need Christ in my life. I need the forgiveness of sins. I need need him to change the type of person what I am because I I keep diving into dumpsters. (laughs) And I need to be changed. I need to be transformed. Well, guess what? You're in the right place. Jesus would say to you, come to me. Come to me, I will wash you, I will make you new, I will transform your life, I'll turn you into a brand new person. I don't know if you saw, if you followed me on Twitter, but I sent out a tweet right before the service that Christianity is far less about going to heaven when we die than it is about becoming like Christ right now. Right now. Jesus died on a cross to wash away your sin, but to transform your life right now, to turn you into the type of person who is able to give out grace and mercy to those who offend them. If you'd like to place your faith in Christ today, all you'd you'd have to do, very simply, you just just trust him. You put your confidence in him. You tell him right now, in this very moment, maybe you're watching online, you say to him, Jesus, I trust you. I believe you died on this cross. I believe you did it because I was a sinner. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I come to you helpless. I'm caught in a dumpster. Would you help me out? He loves to answer that prayer. If that's you right now, would you pray with me? It's a very simple prayer. You say, I've never prayed. Take these words. You can make these words your own. Dear Jesus, I come to you right now, helpless, caught, exposed. I ask you to wash away my sin. Cleanse me. Make me a brand new person. Lift me out of the dumpster. Clean me up. Change my heart. Transform my life. From this day forward, help me to follow you. To trust in you. To turn away from all my old patterns and habits. And to live for you and to honor you with my life. I believe in you. Put my confidence in you. Be my savior today. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, it's very important that you begin reading the scriptures. Here's why. Because as you read the scriptures, God begins to reveal his plan for your life. He begins to transform the way you think, which is so critical. So if you place your faith in Christ, in Christ today, there's tables back here to my right and to my left at, the, at, at your particular campus. There's tables in the back. If you're online and you put your faith in Christ online, send us an email. We'll send one of these to, to you in the mail. And uh, can we give God glory today for what he's done? <laughs> Guys. This stuff works, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, it has smoothed my marriage out. We don't have a perfect marriage. <laughs> but I, when I remember, I, when I tell myself, here's the deal, honey, when, I'm, when, I, when, when I get offended in my own home, when I remind myself, whoa, whoa, bud, hey, bud, you've done that too and much worse, right away it just checks my spirit. And instead of picking up that rock, instead of saying something mean, instead of reacting and, and, and pointing the finger, I said, it's okay. It's okay. It'll be all right. No problem. Here's the type of person I want to become as we wrap this up. I want to become the type of person who says, no problem. It's not a problem. Yeah, but I just did this. I just just offended you. Listen, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Because I've done that too or worse. And, and, And it's just true. So I've been forgiven, and so you're forgiven. Isn't that cool? Isn't that fun? Now, do I always get that right? No, no, but that's what we're in the process of learning that. Let's pray. God, help us to take action. Help us to put this truth. Help us into into a practice in our life. Help us, God, to be honest about ourselves, to understand that we are in need of grace, that we've been shown grace. 
so that we can become the type of people who give grace to those who offend us. God, help us to be honest about the condition of our own heart so that we can come off of a a pedestal with rocks in our hands and put down the rocks. Help us to become unoffendable. We love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you pray to receive Christ, remember to go back and grab your one-year New Testament. God bless you. See you next week. Bring a friend.